If you do have your Bibles, I would invite you to open to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. We have been in this series on the Lord's Prayer together. Over the summer, we've spent some time focusing on worship and now on prayer. And we are in our fourth week uh, going through this prayer together. And what we've seen so far is that the, the first half of the prayer, the first three petitions that the Lord taught us to pray as a model prayer have to do with us and God, have to do with God being the first place in our life, for his will being done, for his kingdom coming into our life and into our world. The second three, the first of the second three we looked at last week, was those have to do with personal petitions that we make to God about our daily needs and our life. And so last week we looked at... Um, give us today our daily bread. How many of you uh, went out and ate some bread for lunch after the message? No? Okay. I did. Anyway. Um, or did I? What did I? I can't even remember. I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday, much less last Sunday. But how many of you have been trying to put this into practice in your life? As the Lord Jesus taught us to pray this prayer and to pray this way, how many of you prayed this prayer at least once this week? Let me see your hands. Amen. How many of you pray this prayer every day this week? All right. How many of you are finding it a blessing to pray this prayer that the Lord taught us, right? And so it's not just about re reciting the words, but it's really about praying it from the heart and praying these ideas and these concepts and these themes from our heart. When I was a little boy and we would spend the night at my grandma's house, my grandparents' house, John and Ruth Bell, we would begin every day at the breakfast table by praying this prayer. She would make us, she made us pray this <laughs> prayer. And as a child, I, I, I just, it felt like it was a ritual. It felt like it was just routine. It, it didn't, I, I didn't feel like it was really, I don't know if real or genuine is the right word, but as, as we've been going through this, and now I am making my children pray this prayer, but really earnestly desiring to pray it from the heart, I realized that it, you know, 100% for her wasn't a routine or ritual or just something that she was doing, that it really was a meaningful way that she was connecting with God. And it's become that for me as well, and I hope it can become that for you. You know, prayer and worship, these are the ways that, that God has given us to have meaningful relationship and connection to God. And so our hope as a church, as we focus on prayer and worship throughout the summer, is that your walk with the Lord would be growing. Amen? Amen. How many of you want that for your life? I want that for my life. It's not enough that I was saved in 1980, whatever, or 1940, whatever, or 19, <laughs> right? Like, I, I don't want, I don't want to be stuck in the past. I, I, I want to move with the Lord in, into what he is doing and where he is going and that I wouldn't be um, feeding on, you know, yesterday's leftovers reheated up in the microwave 150 times over, right? I mean, refried beans are good refried once, right? But if you, <laughs> there comes a point of no return. And our, our relationship with God, the Bible says his mercy, his grace is new every morning, new every morning. So today, the, the prayer point that we're going to look at today is this one of forgiveness. Forgive us our sins or our trespasses or our debts. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And so this is the, the prayer point that we're going to look at today. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now, today, I'm going to be Captain Obvious for you, all right? It's, it's, there's not going to be any light bulbs going off. It's not going to be, wow, I never saw that before. I don't think. Today, it's going to be, I'm going to tell you what you already know. Sometimes we need to be reminded of what we already know, amen? Um, we always need to be reminded of the things that we know. Somehow we seem to forget the things that we know. And so today I'm going to be reminding us of these very, this very important part of forgiveness, uh, being forgiven by God and forgiving others 
that's a big part of our lives. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you taught us how to pray. Lord, that this is a well-worn path that saints for centuries, for millennia now, have used to walk down and to connect with you. Lord, I pray that it wouldn't just be a dead, dry ritual, but that it would be meaningful and helpful in our endeavor to uh, connect with you and to have a growing, vibrant relationship with you. Lord, that is your hope and your heart. That's why you gave us this as a model prayer. Lord, as we look at forgiveness today, I pray that we would uh, again uh, have a new love and appreciation for the forgiveness that you have given us. And Lord, that you would lead us into a lifestyle of forgiving others. Lord, that in all of it, your name, Jesus Christ, would be praised and glorified. It's in that name we pray. Amen. So forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Two things I want you to know, I want you to see about this statement that we are to be praying. Jesus taught us to pray this statement. Two things. Number one, you need to be forgiven. I said I'm going to be Captain Obvious today. You need to be forgiven. Sin is real. Sin is real. It exists. I know we don't hear a lot uh, today in our modern culture about sin. We hear a lot about syndromes and symptoms and low self-esteem and, and you know, treatments via drugs and all kinds of things for our problems. And not that that's not valid. I'm not saying that that's not valid. But I, I do believe, I honestly do believe that what one generation previously called sin, we now just call, you know, low self-esteem, mental illness, and not that those things don't exist. Don't hear me wrong. I believe those things exist. But the Bible says that there is a thing called sin. Amen. Thank you. And it does exist. That there is right and there is wrong. There is good and there is evil. There is truth and there is lies. And we, we as human beings, we don't get to decide what goes in the good category or the evil category. We don't get to decide what goes in the right category and the wrong category. That's God's job. God, creator God, he decides what's in the good category and he decides what's in the evil category. And we as humanity, what we constantly want to do is we want to put our play, ourselves in the place of God. Where we set ourselves up as the kings of our own kingdom, the master of our own destiny, and we say, well, this is going to be right for me no matter what God's law says. And humanity for its entire existence has been doing this, trying to put ourselves, trying to redefine what God has said and what God has spoken. Amen. So we don't hear a lot about sin today, but we all have sinned. We all have sinned against God. You know, I was, um, several years ago, I was working with a young man in the church who had recently given his life to the Lord. He came out of a, a, just a very broken and, and, you know, sinful life, and he'd given his life to the Lord. And he was endeavoring to now live righteously, live right for the Lord. And he made this statement to me. He said, I never realized how bad I was until I got saved. I never realized how sinful I was until I had my sins forgiven. You, you see, sin to us is like, fi is like water to a fish. We, we, sin has affected and infected every area of our lives. We sin all the time and we don't even realize it or know it. It's like a fish. You know, you can't go to a fish and say, hey, you're wet. The fish will say, what are you talking about? This is just the way I am. And people, because of sin, we are born broken, bent towards sin, bent against God. I like this quote by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said this, No man knows how bad he is 
till he has tried very hard to be good. <laughs> those of you who are Christians now, you know what this is like. Yes. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. After all, you find out the strength of an army by fighting against it, not by giving into it. You find out the strength of a wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows the full of what temptation means. That's C.S. Lewis. Those of you who have, who have been born again, who have given your lives to Jesus, you know what this is like. You know what it's like to now feel sin, feel the weight of sin, and, and know, know that I'm not just going to give in to every temptation. This is why God sent his son Jesus into the world, to forgive us of our sins. Because honestly, there's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves. There's no magic formula, there's no silver bullet, there's no, there's no X, Y, and Z that I could do to have my sins forgiven. So I needed Jesus Christ to come, Amen. to come and to save me. That's what Jesus said. He said he came to seek and to save the lost. You see, God, because of his great love for us, has made a way for our sins to be forgiven. For our sins to be forgiven. And if you've never put your faith and your trust and your hope in Jesus Christ, I want to tell you, put your trust in Jesus. Have your sins forgiven. Your sins is a burden that you were not designed to carry. And God laid upon Jesus on the cross your sin. Jesus carried your burden. Jesus carried your debt. He paid it in full. You don't have to carry your burden of sin anymore. It will crush you. It crushed Jesus. But God laid it upon him. And on the third day, he rose to newness of life, defeating sin, conquering Satan, the death, hell, and the grave. So that all of us who have put our faith in him, we too have new life through Jesus Christ. Our sins washed away. This is why Jesus came to set us free from our sin. Now, Jesus taught us to pray this prayer and that when we pray, we would pray this way. So the question comes up, if I sin, am I still saved? If I sin, am I still saved? Do I have to get re-saved? Is that what this is saying? That every time I sin, I need to ask Jesus back into my life, ask Jesus back into my heart, that I need to resubmit my life to Christ? Is that what this is saying? No, it's not. It's not. If you've put your faith in Jesus, if, if you are born again, if you are that new creation, if you are in Christ, I believe you are saved. I believe that you have security in Christ. I believe that. I don't believe that every time we sin that we have to, you know, ask Jesus back into our lives and go through that whole process again. The best way that I can explain it is it's, it's somewhat like, but not completely, but it's somewhat like a marriage. Now, in a marriage, those of you who are married or have been married, you understand that from time to time, offenses enter into the marriage. That from time to time, a husband especially will do things that are, are less than smart and offend the wife. Amen. Can I get an amen from the husbands? Amen. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You did something like that on the way to church today. Amen. Now, when I offend my wife, I'm still married. I'm still married. But there is a break in fellowship because of the offense. 
There's a break in fellowship. There's a break in relationship. There's a break in intimacy because of the offense. Now, if I will humble myself and go to my wife and say, I'm so sorry, uh, would you please forgive me? Uh, I was wrong. You're always right. Uh, <laughs> what will happen? There will be restored fellowship. There will be a, a continuing of being able to walk together. Now, when I offend Heather, guess what we don't have to do? I don't have to call up the pastor. I don't have to, you know, make an arrangement at the church. We don't have to decorate the chapel. You know, me squeeze into the tuxedo, her get into the wedding dress, call all the guests, come walk down the aisle and say our vows again. Why? Because we're still married. There's been a break in fellowship. There's been a break in relationship. There's been a break in intimacy. But we're still married. And so what this is talking about is that when we do sin, and we will, that you don't have to come down the aisle again. Jesus, I'm, I don't want to go to hell. I'm giving you my life. No, if you're God's child, you're God's child. But there is a break in fellowship that sin does break. It, it brings separation between us and God. And so when the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, we need to go to him and say, Father, would you forgive me for my sin? Does that make sense? So uh, 1 John 2 verse 1, this is what uh, the apostle John wrote. He said, he says, I'm writing to you so that you wouldn't sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. That, that we have a way for our sins to be forgiven. Plan A is that we wouldn't sin, right? That, that we wouldn't give in to temptation. But if we do, we do have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who, who is, is between us and God. He is our pathway to God. It's through him that we have right fellowship and relationship with God. So that when we do sin, we don't have to go through this whole thing of, you know, God doesn't love me anymore. Am I even saved? I might as well just go back to my old life and my old lifestyle. No. We can go straight to God. And this is why Jesus taught us to pray this way. And this is a daily thing. We, we daily fall short. Amen? We daily fall short. I will tell you how I fell short the other day. Confession is good for the soul, and my soul needs some good stuff. So, um, this last week, my wife and I we went to a eating establishment. I'm not going to mention the name, um, but we went somewhere, and they had a coup. I had a coupon. I had a bogo, uh, buy one get one free. I don't know why it's not called a bogoff, but anyway, it's a bogo. Buy one, get one. And so I went in there all excited and happy because, you know, I like free stuff. How many of you like free stuff? Amen. Amen. So I go in there and I place my order and I say, I've got this BOGO. And the lady said, I'm sorry, but that BOGO doesn't apply to the item you ordered. <laughs> and I said, well, I think it should apply to the item that I ordered. <laughs> And then she went into some very esoteric, technical reason why the, the item I ordered didn't apply to the BOGO. And so I gave her what has become known as the death stare. <laughs> I don't know if you know what this is, but this is where if you were Superman and can shoot lasers out of your eyes, she would have been extra crispy by the time... <laughs> we would have been done. And so we get in the car and my wife says, why do you do that? <laughs> and I sat there and I thought, I don't know. I don't know why I do this. And so as I'm praying this prayer, Father, forgive me of my sins. The Bible says to be kind to one another tender-hearted I was not kind nor was I tender-hearted 
to the lady who didn't give me my BOGO. <laughs> we fall short. We sin every day. This Praying this prayer, it, it keeps us humble. It keeps us close to the cross. It keeps us close to the source of our forgiveness. That we wouldn't become puffed up with pride. That we wouldn't become to begin to think that we are without sin. The Bible says if any man says he's without sin, he's a liar. That, that we, would, we would ask the Lord, Holy Spirit, would you, would you show me where I'm falling short so that I can ask for forgiveness and repent. And notice he says, he's, he, he says, don't go to God and say, God, I'm sorry. He says, go to God and say, God, would you forgive me? There's a big difference in saying you're sorry and asking for forgiveness. There's a big difference. Asking for forgiveness admits you are guilty. Saying you're sorry doesn't. I can go to somebody, I, you know, I can say something careless with my words and hurt somebody. This is a real situation that happens from time to time. And if I go to that person, I say, I'm sorry if I offended you. I'm sorry if you were offended by what I said. I'm sorry if you got hurt, right? But if I come and I say, would you forgive me? for my careless words. Huge difference. One puts the blame on the other person. The other is me accepting the guilt. So this is us coming to God and say, God, I know I'm guilty, but would you forgive me because of your great love and mercy and grace that I'm resting in and I'm standing in today. And this is learned behavior, right? Uh, we're teaching this to our children. That, that when, when there's an offense between the children, which is like five million times a day, she kicked him, he hit her, she called him, you know, duty head and, and just name, you know, all this stuff. We teach our children, go and ask your brother to forgive you. And then we follow it up with this next principle, with this second principle. You have to forgive them. Asking for forgiveness and then giving forgiveness. So point number one, there is sin and we need forgiveness. Point number two, for Captain Obvious today, is you need to forgive others. You need to forgive others. And here's what I want you to see. These two are connected. These two things are connected. You see that word as? That we would be forgiven our sins as we are forgiving those who sin against us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, the Apostle Paul put it this way, Ephesians 4, 32, Paul says this, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So the idea is that you have been forgiven much, and because of that, in light of God's forgiveness for you, you should be transformed and able to forgive others. And this is where we're going to Matthew chapter 18 this morning. If you have it, we're going to start in verse 21. Peter came up to Jesus and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? So Lord, I've got this brother and he's continuously doing this evil against me. He's sinning against me. He's lying against me. He's cheating. He's, he's done me wrong in a business deal. He's slandered my reputation. Lord, I've got this person. He's sinned against me. How many times do I have to forgive him? Peter says, up to seven times? Like that's some kind of big thing that he's doing. Like Peter, I think Peter's expecting Jesus to say, wow, Peter, you're so amazing. You're such a forgiving person that you would forgive somebody seven times? Wow. Hey, all other 11 disciples, let's come and listen to Peter. He's got this great idea about how we need to forgive people seven times. <laughs> Jesus says to Peter, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven for you math people, that's 490 times. What Jesus is saying is not that when they sin against you 491 times, you don't have to forgive. What Jesus is saying is that you always have to forgive. 
Jesus took Peter's number that he thought was big and he said, it's not, you're not even anywhere close, Peter. We have to be living in and walking in a lifestyle of forgiveness. And then Jesus gave this parable. I want to read you the whole parable and just let it sink in. He said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. So there's some servants in the king's kingdom that owe him some money. And when he came to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. Now a talent, a talent is a unit of measuring money that was 20 years wages. One talent, 20 years wages. So think about how much you make in a year, multiply that times 20, now multiply that times 10,000, okay? That's the amount of money that we're talking about here. That's a lot of money. We're talking billions of dollars. So what Jesus is saying is that there was a man who owed the king basically an in, incalculable number, some astronomical figure. And so he comes to the king, and since he could not pay his master, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A hundred denarii is about $12,000. So still, a sum of money, right? I mean, if somebody owed me $12,000 and they didn't pay, that would make a difference in my life. How many of that would make a difference in your life, right? Yeah. So this is still a sum of money that is significant, but it's less than 1% of what he owed. And so he finds this guy, he walks out of the presence of the king, he finds this guy that owes him a hundred denarii, and he seizes him, and he begins to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. His fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience me with me, and I will pay you. And it says that he refused and went and put him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. You see, we have been forgiven of so much. The debt that we owe is incalculable. And in light of the forgiveness that we have received, we must also go and do likewise we must be willing to forgive the sins against us, which is so much smaller than the debt that we owe to God for our sin. You see, forgiveness is not something we re only that we receive. It's something that we also must give. Christians should be the most forgiving people on planet Earth. Christians should not hold grudges. Christians should not keep a record of wrong. Amen? Why? Because love does not permit it. Love does not permit me to keep a record of wrong. Love does not permit me to hold grudges. Love does not permit me to be bitter and unforgiving. Forgiveness is not something that just flows to us. Forgiveness must also flow through us. The forgiveness we give is in light of the forgiveness we receive. Now, this is a command from the Lord that we would forgive others. It's a command, right? And so that means it's non-negotiable. You have to forgive others. God says to do it. So if I choose to walk in unforgiveness, 
I am sinning against God. You need to see this. You need to see that when you choose not to forgive others for whatever they've done to you, that you are now sinning against God. Unforgiveness is disobedience to God. And when, the, when I now sin against God, now there's broken fellowship, right? Point number one, forgive us our sins. There's, there's a breakdown in fellowship, relationship, intimacy, all of those things when I choose not to forgive others. And no one's sin against me is worth my relationship with God being compromised. No one's sin against you is worth your fellowship with God being compromised by holding on to unforgiveness. When we hold on to unforgiveness in our life, we stop growing as people. We stop growing in our walk with the Lord. We stop producing fruit, good fruit. Bitterness comes in, resentment. It it, it starts to transform us from the inside out in, into not the people that God has called us to be. Now, sometimes forgiveness is a daily thing. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it's daily. Sometimes you have to wake up every day and say, God, I'm choosing to walk in forgiveness today against so-and-so because of, I know they're going to sin against me already before I even show up to work. <laughs> and sometimes walking in forgiveness is a daily thing. Sometimes when an offense is so large... And it cuts so deep that it does, it it is a process of forgiving every single day. And when those feelings of anger and resentment and bitterness try to come in, and how could they do this to me, and they stole this from me, and I'll never be able to get that back, I have to say, God, I'm choosing to forgive. I'm choosing to walk in forgiveness. Help me, God, as you have forgiven me, that I may forgive them as well. Forgiveness is not letting them off the hook. Forgiveness is me saying, God, I'm choosing to put them and this situation in your hands. Lord, I ultimately trust in you to handle this. Lord, you do what is right. You can see and do the right thing. And I'm gonna trust in you, God, to do it. I'm taking it out of my hands and I'm putting it in your hands. I'm taking my hurt and I'm giving it to you. I'm taking my pain and I'm giving it to you. I'm taking my brokenness and I'm giving it to you, God. You do what's right. I'm trusting in you. I'm going to trust in you. You know, we tend to think of our relationship with God as as one thing and our relationship with others as a separate thing. But I want you to see that the two are They are absolutely connected. And if my relationship with God is not changing the way I relate to other people, I really need to look at and evaluate my relationship with God. I know that's a strong statement, but I'm telling you that because I love you. If if your relationship with God, your love that you've received from God, the forgiveness you've received, if all of those things have poured into your life, but they're not pouring out of your life. You really need to stop and look again at what God has done for you. You really need to look at your relationship with God because your relationship with God will change the relationships you have with others. It has to. It has to. So asking for forgiveness is is acknowledging my guilt, giving forgiveness, Giving forgiveness is acknowledging somebody else's guilt, but choosing to love them anyway. It's all about love. Choosing to forgive is not ignoring the offense. It's acknowledging, yeah, you did me wrong, but I'm choosing to forgive you. I'm choosing to love you anyway. This is why Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. And we, we know that phrase, love covers a multitude of sins. But what I want you to see is that cover does not mean it overlooks. Covering sins actually means seeing it clearly, but choosing to see the, the offending party through the eyes of love and choosing to forgive. You know, kind of like the way God sees you, right? Right? He sees you not as the offending party, but he sees you through the eyes of love. 
and he has forgiven you, we must walk in the same way that God has loved us. We must love in the same way. Covering is not overlooking. It's not sweeping it under the rug. It's not trying to forget it. No, it's actually acknowledging it and saying, I've been hurt by this, but I'm choosing to love. I'm choosing to obey God. I'm choosing to forgive this person. Whether they ask me to forgive them or not, you can't wait for that. Don't wait for that. Well, they haven't asked for forgiveness yet. It's been 15 minutes. Or 20 years. I mean, some of the people, uh, let's just be honest in here, some of the people that you're holding grudges against and bitterness against, they're never going to ask you to forgive them. Some of them, they can't. They're in, they're in the dirt. They're in the grave. You've got to let it go. You have to let it go. Forgiveness will, unforgiveness, unforgiveness will rob you. It, it is a thief. It is a silent thief. It will rob you. Unforgiveness is like shackles that hold you to your past. Forgiveness is the key that unlocks you from your past and sets you free to live the life that God has called you to live. Forgiveness sets us free from our our. our our, our, our past of sin and brokenness, forgiveness we receive from God, but forgiveness we offer to others, it sets us free from the offenses. It sets us free from the hurt. It sets us free from the pain and the wounds. You know, Satan, what he wants to do is he wants to rob you. He wants to steal from you the destiny, the plan, the purpose that God has for you to steal, kill, and destroy but Jesus came that we would have life and life abundantly. If you look at your life and you say, I don't know if I've got that abundant life. Yes, I'm saved. Yes, I love the Lord. But man, I, I just don't feel like I have that abundant life. I would invite you to evaluate relationships. Are you holding on to hurts from the past? Have you not choose, chosen to walk in forgiveness? That could be one of the keys. It could be one of the keys that is robbing the joy from your life. If you're holding on to pain and resentment and unforgiveness. What Satan wants to do is he, he wants to... You see, when we, when we give our lives to Christ, the Bible says that we are a new creation, that we are in Christ. It, it's an identity replacement. We're, we're no longer sinners, but we're now saints. Saints, forgiven, children of God. That's who we are. We sing that song. That's what I am or whatever that song is. Anyway, it's a good song we sing. Right? I am what he says I am, or I don't know. Anyway, we sing that song. Um, I'm sorry, I was thinking of Popeye for some reason. Okay. <laughs> so, we have a new identity. We've been declared righteous, we've been justified before God, we've been set free. We've been filled with power, the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ alive inside of you to transform your life from the inside out, to transform your world from the inside out. But Satan, through unforgiveness, he can, he can rob you of your identity because if, 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 if you allow yourself to be chained to your past, you're not a victor in Christ. You still are a victim of your circumstances. I'm a victim of this, I'm a victim of that. I was this, I was, they did this to me. It keeps you chained, it robs you of your identity. Listen, I've had stuff done to me. I've had horrible stuff done to me. I've had stuff done to, to me that, that I can't even talk about here. I've had bad stuff done to me, but that's not who I am. I'm not a victim of those things because through Jesus Christ, I am victorious. I am victorious. And here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. I've done stuff to people. I've also, it's not just that I've been sinned against. I've sinned against others. So I need to not just like pretend that I'm, you know, uh, just, you know, innocent in my life. I, I need to understand that I have forgiven of my sin 
and I've been set free from the sins that have been committed against me and daily I can go before the Lord and thank him for that. I can walk in restored fellowship and as I pray this prayer, I can learn to begin to forgive others and to be set free from my past. Amen. Amen.